that divine person. And then that divine person will not be ontologically equal with the other three. And thus will not be divine. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's an additional problem that okay. I just yeah. thought of. Yes. Uh, and thank you for explaining okay. that. Because, sorry, uh, sometimes it, I'm not clear, sorry. Because sometimes you have to, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a, correct me if I'm wrong, it's an act of essence that God from this argument would create um, some entity to share the love with and an entity to cooperate to share the love yes, with yes. but it would be an act of will to create a fourth entity yes. okay? but someone can say well if it, it may not be an act of uh, essence it may be an act of will but it could have happened okay but the problem you have is another essential attribute of a divine person is metaphysical necessity now the problem is met metaphysical necessity means that being cannot not have existed now the problem that you have is any being that's created by will is contingent it didn't have to exist so with that um argument here by creating that fourth divine person that divine person would be contingent rather than necessary and so then might not have existed and thus will not have the essential attribute of metaphysical necessity and so wouldn't be divine in the same way as the other three divine persons okay so those three divine persons are each necessary metaphysically right. necessary and, and, and you would say the uh, the fourth one would be contingent because it would come from an act of will act of will it didn't have to exist and also at one point it did not exist and one point did not exist okay so now coupling this problem with the initial i just remembered what my other problem okay, was okay, okay. which is why that definition of love okay. the definition of love is okay so you have a wife you share everything with your wife yes. and then you have a child and then with you and your wife you don't cooperate and share that you're taking those definitions and you're throwing them up towards the divine right um metaphysically <laughs> so how how does oh yeah that, the, the, but you had you had those people at the at your um <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what was the point? Yeah, so this definition, like, why, why, should we go why should we go with it? Yeah, so I take a specific view of religious language um, for the univocal view. So I take that terms that we use for God are univocal when they're used in a normal, mundane human context. Uh, I don't understand. So, so sorry, I take a univocal view. Um, to our use of language. Univocal just basically means when we use a word, it's used in the same way as when we apply it to God. So if I say, if I understand what goodness is by a human context, that is also applicable to God in the same way. Right, but yes. there's a big problem with that. that, that yeah, so, yeah. so I'll, I'll give you a problem from the Islamic, the Islamic theological framework, right? And that problem is, say, um, God says in the Quran, God says he will forget them like they forgot him. Now, as a Muslim, when I read that verse of the Quran in which God says, I will forget them like they forgot him, God, right? I know that that forgetfulness is not the same as for a human being and God because God would be deficient. So uh, forgetfulness in the human sense is you have a cognitive deficiency, you forgot to recollect a particular memory, uh, retrieve it in some way or the other, and God, it doesn't apply to you. So also this would apply to things like, okay, so um, when it comes to the Islamic theological framework, uh, and also in Christianity, this attributes of God which I mentioned, like the hand of God, or these types of things. But we know, as Muslims and Christians, and again, I may be, I may be making statements about Christian theology, if I'm correct, and also I believe this is the same for the Jewish people, is when it does say things like the hand of God, we know that doesn't mean a physical, you know, tendons and this type of thing, that in Islam we have a, a, a whole discussion on this, but we wouldn't take forgetfulness or other types of things and then say, okay, it's exactly like a human thing, right? So, that is something, what did you call it? Uni... Univocal. So, Univocal. Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah, so there, there's three different distinctions between languages. You have univocal, equivocal, and analogical. So basically, univocal, univocal means you use the word in the same way, in, the same, in a different context. And that's the view you hold? That's the view I hold. Sure. Equivocal means you're using the word, but not, it doesn't mean the same thing. Okay, so I'll give you an example. When I use the word uh, bat, 
And um, you need to ask me what I'm talking about. So I could be talking about a cricket bat, or I could be talking about a bat that's flying or around. Or the wing of a hospital. Or the wing, yeah. So those words are using an equivocal sense. Yeah. Equivocal. Yes. Univocal just means like, let's say blue. If I say I have blue shoes, and you have blue shoes, or the sky is blue, I'm using blue in the exact same way. Um, and then analogical is where you're saying you're using it in a similar way, it's very similar to it, but it's not exactly the same. And logical gets a little bit more difficult, so let's just go with the first two. Univocal, I'm trying to say to you that I don't believe you can use equivocal language when you're talking about God. You're saying, yeah, God is good, but God is not good in the same way that we mean goodness. God is powerful, but God is not powerful in the same way that we mean power. Because then the question is, what are you meaning then when you say God is powerful? We only understand it because we have an understanding of what power is in our context. We then apply that, but then what we do is that we qualify it when we apply it to God. We say God is powerful, but God is all powerful. God is knowing, but God is all knowing. God is good, but God is all good or, pa or perfectly good. And so we qualify it. So we say God is good in this way that we mean goodness. Mother Teresa is good, but she's not good exactly like God because God is perfectly good. But we are using the word in the same way in those in, in, in those different contexts. But Josh, isn't there a problem? Not only as in well, Muslims would deny that use yes, of yeah. language, but also I think some Christians would also say that that's no, not. No, so it's yeah. So it's this view was debated in Christian theology throughout the century. So you have Thomas Aquinas. He went against the univocal view. Um, I would expect. Yeah, he went against it, but he he then at one point he was holding to the equivocal, but then he believed that that was problematic, so he took the analogical route. Um, you have Moses, my mother. So, 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 so ju just about this. Yes. So that would mean Son Aquinas would not accept this he argument. No, no, he wouldn't accept. He never followed this argument. Um, but I'm not a Thomist, so I don't hold to everything that Aquinas says. You're not what? I'm not a Thomist, so I don't hold to everything that Aquinas says. Yeah. Um, he is very amazing, but in areas I would disagree with him. Um, because I would say that. So from, from, yeah. from if I, if I uh, just to um, clarify, yeah. that would basically mean. A large section of Christianity, uh, Christians, would not accept this argument because well, of language. I would say that actually, contemporary sort of philosophy of religion, looking at religious language, they have, they are taking more the univocal route. So what, what, um, would, you, what would you say, just for my knowledge, yes. I'm ignorant on this, yes. uh, William Lane Craig, what does he hold? Univocal. Really? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, so univocal uh, him, uh, Swinburne, Plantinger. Alistair McGrath? Uh, I'm not certain about McGrath, because he's he's more of a theologian than a philosopher, so I, I don't look into but let's the three main Christian thinkers will be Alvin Plantinga, yeah. Richard Swinburne, and then to a lesser extent William Lane Craig. They all share this view. And so there's this debate in Christian theology between something called classical theism and theistic personalism. So basically theistic personalism, personalism. and classical theism. Yeah, right. theistic personalism basically says that God is a person like us, but he is a supernatural person. He is all powerful, all known. So that's the view I'm arguing for. Right. Saying God is actually a person like us, but he's not limited like us in our power, limited in the knowledge, limited in goodness. And that fits the equal uh, univocal. Univocal view. But then you'll have the classical theists who argue more the Thomistic route and say, actually, we don't believe this um, this theistic personalism. The main idea is because of divine simplicity. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. Yeah, yeah, this. Um, uh, so God is without parts. So yeah, this, God is uh, not composed of any parts. Keith, I think Keith Ward uses this. Maybe, yeah, he might use it. I'm not, not really yeah. certain. But it's basically Thomas was very, very strong. Thomas Aquinas and this idea that God is simple uh, in a divine simplicity sense. This basically means God lacks all parts. And so what God has, God is identical to. Now, so God is identical to his goodness, God is identical to his power, God is yeah. identical to his essence. I, yeah, I'll give you, the, yeah. uh, I'll give you a little uh, Islamic yeah. uh, theological sort of nugget here, right? Um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, yes. said, reflect about creation, do not reflect about God, because you cannot basically grasp the essence of God except by believing in him. So when it comes to these types of things, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the whole discussion around good. Okay. What is good, right? Um, and two people may have, one may be a consequentialist, one may be a Kantian, they may disagree yes. on good, one may be a theist or an atheist, yes. but they both know what they're talking about. There's like that common denominator. So when it comes to God, we wouldn't go as far as I think what Christian theologians have been doing, which is you take it to a, 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 a such a... Um, such a such a discussion where it's almost like everyone's climbing up the tree, people go into different branches, and then they're talking past each other. Because it depends on which language view you hold on to and which, which framework you hold on to. And again, I'll go back to my initial point, which is 
God's message should be very simple and the Islamic theological framework is extremely simple and we would also argue that Moses, Abraham and, and all the rest of God's prophets they would be completely baffled by say these sort of discussions they would believe what I believe right they wouldn't go down this sort of route yeah but I think because that... God's not the author of confusion okay, that's okay. one Bible verse I know okay <laughs> well, well, well I'll have to disagree with you is that um, I do agree with you that things should be simple but when we are trying to understand things specifically which are ontologically different from us, they can be difficult to grasp and understand. So I would say with you, we have a shared problem with, for example, understanding what it means for God to be all-knowing. So being omniscient, you would hold to as a Muslim, God is omniscient, he knows all things. I will hold to it, so I'll hold to it as well as a Christian. But then we will have problems because we're trying to understand, well, God is all-knowing, but what about the idea of human free will? Does human free will negate God being all-knowing? Can he know, does he have foreknowledge? Can he know the truth? You're very right, Josh. And Christians would get into those discussions, and some Muslims did in the past as well. However, from an Islamic perspective, we would simply say, God is all-knowing, and human beings have free choice, we can, we can take actions. Logically, how do you make sense of it? We as Muslims would simply say, we just believe in it, uh, right? That, that's difficult though, because I mean... It's not really. No, but think about it. I mean, I can understand that if you're in a, um, a non-pluralistic environment where everyone's a Muslim, where everyone shares the same worldview as you, um, they, it's very easy to just say, yeah, we have these things which are difficult to reconcile uh, logically, but we just believe it. But if you're in a, if we're in the 21st century pluralistic environment where there are different options in play here, um, and people want to understand which one has truth value, which worldview actually has truth value. Well, if one worldview is saying that there is this God who is all-knowing and he has foreknowledge, he knows the future, but yet also you're required to believe that God, is, we have free will, and probably in the libertarian sense, that you can choose A or choose B without being necessitated to choose anyone, then you have a problem because you're saying, well, how does God have this knowledge? Because how, I mean, if I'm gonna choose a pizza tomorrow, yeah, instead of a burger to eat for, let's say, dinner or something like that, um, did God know that before? Well, yeah, he did know it before, but then does that mean then that I have a choice? Because no, 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 I could falsify his I, I get you, Ishan. So my problem is you can't escape the question if we want to argue for the no, truth. But, but we're not escaping the question. Well, we're not escaping the question. We're just giving the actual answer from the Islamic perspective. Even discussing, having deep theological discussions about predestination is something which is discouraged, right? Now, in terms of, like you said, we in the 21st century, in the 21st century, there's lots of options and people are having these sort of discussions, these questions are opened up. But remember, look, there's nothing new under the sun. If we look back at during the time of uh, Jesus, right? Um, I think it was uh, a Roman soldier or a Greek soldier who came up to either Jesus or one of his disciples. And um, there was some sort of question uh, about God and one of the Greek or Roman soldiers, because they were affected by uh, Hellenistic philosophy, they said something to the effect of what is God or something like this. I don't remember this exact passage in the Bible, but as in from the early days of Christianity in the early days of Islam, you've always had many different philosophies competing. It's not that in the 21st century we've had this and we haven't had this in the past. The second thing is, what I would do, and I do this often, uh, maybe some people like this, but some people don't. Not every question is an answer. Sometimes people ask the wrong question. So for example, somebody may ask me, how do you reconcile Islam and free will? Or how, uh, sorry, free will and predestination. Or someone may ask me as a Muslim, why is it that your prophet married an animal? Or why is it as a Muslim you have this or this or this or this? I would redirect them to a more important question is, what do you think is going to happen after you die? Do you believe in God? What do you think about the fact that we're materialistic and we should be connected back to God? So I would take people back to more important questions rather than dealing with questions which, frankly, people don't realize, but they're irrelevant to their salvation. Okay, but why I would say it's not irrelevant is because before you can, as I was saying before, before you can claim something has a truth value, that thing has to be coherent. Yes. That thing has to make sense um, if it's going to have some form of, we will even be able to understand if it has truth value yeah. or not. Now, the problem that you have is there is a lot for some people there is a logical contradiction with the idea that we have as humans free will and that God is has foreknowledge. 
So someone would just simply say to you, I'm not even going to even begin to look into Islam because the Islamic concept of God is incoherent. Okay. So the same way that you were saying before, married bachelors, um, married bachelors or squared circles or whatever, those things are um, logically incoherent. So I'm not, I don't even look uh, to see if but, they have any truth. But, but we as Muslims wouldn't say, we would simply say it's a lack of our knowledge, right? So I'll give you an example. Firstly, when it comes to coherence, it's a very slippery term, right? And there's a whole discussion about what coherence means, what it doesn't mean. However, as a Christian, you must agree with me that for the most part, most of the questions which are being asked even about Christianity are questions which are irrelevant to the central core message of Christianity. And the same I would argue for Islam. That most of the questions that people ask about Islam, the most, what do you think of uh, ISIS or Al Qaeda? Of course, we're going to give an answer like we don't believe in that nonsense. But at the same time, we have to bring people back to the core of the belief, right? And I believe, and I don't, I'm not sure if you've gotten into this before, but these discussions never end. Discussions about, I mean, look, philosophically, we just had a discussion earlier about Richard Swinburne's argument. You did a PhD in uh, Trinity, right? So I'm guessing what, 100,000 words? 84. 84. You spent four years, five years? No, three, three, three years. Three, three, three and a half. Your three years worth of work, you can't say you finished the discussion. Oh. But what I... Do you see? And, and I'm not saying I agree with this, because I don't agree. But um, say a Christian missionary goes to an African village, right? They go to Philippines, they go to uh, whatever, Romania. They go to any place in the world, and this place, they're trying to preach Christianity. They're not going to open up a can of worms, like here. They're just going to tell people, this is how you get salvation, right? As a Muslim, I try and do the same thing. This is how you get salvation. I don't want to open up for them deep theological problems which philosophers and theologians have not resolved for hundreds of years. But I would say to you, where I agree with you in part, where I disagree with you is because you need to emphasize that conversations like these are relative to the context. So, obviously, if I'm going to a tribe in Africa and I want to tell them about Jesus, I'm not going to start talking about omniscience and homo usiasi. And so, so, omnipotent. so, Josh, why doesn't that apply to anybody else? No, no, so I'm saying if we're having, it depends on person. So, if I'm speaking to, let's say, a fellow philosopher or a fellow you know, intellectual in this specific area, we might have this debate because you might say, actually, when you actually reflect on the attributes of God, they cancel each other out or there is a problem here, blah, blah, blah. But, but if I'm speaking to, let's say, someone else, um, I'm not going to go and say, hey, you know this issue or blah blah blah, blah. because they don't need to know until they come to the problem. Okay, because but, yeah, but Josh, here's, here's an issue I have with that. I do see what you're trying to get to, but here's an issue I have with that. A lot of the people who raise these type of problems, yes. right, the free will paradox, whatever, you usually get this from people who don't even believe in God in the first place. Right? So what I do with people like that is I first talk to them about God without getting into this discussion first. Because their reason for asking is not to get an answer. It's just a way of distracting the conversation away from God. Like I truly believe that when people, especially uh, a, lot, a lot of atheists that I deal with, when they come up with questions like this, things about the free will, or things about uh, the morality of the 7th century, or the morality of the uh, century during the time of Moses or whatever, I see these as red herrings because the central issue is they don't want to submit to God. Right? So that's why I don't bother with these discussions. Well, I, would say, I would say it's not a red herring. Oh, it depends a person because obviously they might just be saying it. Well, I most of the time speak to atheists. No, but I would say to you that um, these debates, actually, a lot of them are not happening by um, atheists, they're actually happening by people who are fierce, who are saying, actually, the concept of... It's an in, inter-Christian in, issue. Yeah, so I'm saying, so I'll give you an example, again, with Richard Swinburne, Swinburne will actually argue that, given this issue of free will, God doesn't have full knowledge. So God is omniscient, but he lacks full knowledge because of free will. So he would actually say that a coherent view of God would not hold to omniscience that includes full knowledge. And so this is problematic because, I promise you, the majority of people will say, I'm not going to worship a God who doesn't know the future. That's a problem. Of course it's a problem yeah. and this is why um, 
saying that statement, uh, at least from an Islamic perspective, would be tantamount to not believing in God in the first Yeah, but he would say, he would say, but at the end of the day, you need to be intellectually, not yet, I'm saying in general, we need to be intellectually grounded in our understanding of God, because maybe many things that we right. believed about God yeah. don't make sense. So I'll give you an example. Um, okay, so, okay yeah. just a point here. If something doesn't make sense to us as limited beings, it doesn't mean that that state of affairs is not true. As an example, say let's go back a hundred years, you're an intelligent person, if I came up to you, not hundred years, two hundred years, came up to you and I said to you, in the future, this idea that, the simple idea, that the world is made up of atoms which are indivisible, that's going to be thrown away, and we're going to have a crazy world of quantum mechanics, where things react differently to when they're being observed, to what they're not being observed, and all that crazy stuff. You will say that doesn't make any sense to you. Right? But not making sense to you does not mean that quantum mechanics is not real. So when it comes to these issues, the way I see it is we need to redirect people back to the core of salvation. From an Islamic perspective, salvation is by the simple message of La ilaha illallah, which means there's none worthy of worship except God. And all of these questions, I believe, are just distractions to the real core message. Because you must, by now, of course you've done philosophy, you know this, even you, after years of studying, there is no clear conclusion to any of this. Um, oh no, I'll disagree with that. I think you can, in philosophy, you can come to... Sorry, I'm going to do Sorry. Um, you can come to um, conclusions in certain philosophical issues. Um, so I'll give you an example. In epistemology, you have Edmund Gettier. Uh, you might have heard of him in the 60s. Wrote a, like, a two-page paper, uh, which basically showed that uh, true knowledge, justified knowledge. Yeah, is knowledge is not knowledge is not. It doesn't justified equate to justified belief. truth. But no, but Josh, Josh, something. One second. I'll just say. Yeah. That is something you can come to. No, but Josh, that yeah. proves my point. Yeah. Because the Gettier problem shows that a consensus for 2,000 years was demolished. I agree with you, I agree with you. So, no, agree. If, if anything, it, goes, it, it supports my idea that philosophy will never end and something that everybody believes in true justified belief at the, uh, you know, from the time of Aristotle or whatever, you can now have, you can have a formula to actually come up with Gettier problems, which shows that that, that is not correct. So, consensus for 2,000 years in philosophy means nothing. Yeah, yeah, no, so I'm not agreeing with you. Maybe Gettier is going to be yeah, disproven. I'm, yeah, I agree with you. I'm not saying, I don't think consensus um, have a lot of ed evidential weight. It has some evidential weight, but it'll be sort of a cherry on the, the top of the, the cake that you add to your argument that everyone believes in. It's not and you know what someone else can do as well? Yeah. They can look at, like, they can look at Ed Edmund Gettier, and we may say, Gettier has worked it out, you know, he's got, um, he's, he's gotten rid of this traditional concept. Somebody can just say, well, that's belief first epistemology, I'm going to go with knowledge first epistemology, right? And they'll just reroute the entire discussion. So, what I'm, no, yeah. what I'm trying to get to is, I don't care about these issues, I care about salvation. Yes. And but for me, these my, are yeah, my, my argument, what I was trying to say to you is that, again, just going back to my point, was, we, the whole question was, I think when we started, was, why should I hold to Islam? You said to me that um, believing in one God, you didn't use the term, but you were basically saying it entails belief in Islam, so it leads to belief in Islam. Yep. It doesn't lead to yeah, it doesn't lead to any other belief. But I'll say to you that actually there can be questions about the truth value of certain propositional statements that you tell me about. Islam. So you might tell me certain certain things are free will. Yeah, free will in that. And so my issue is about logical coherence. Logical coherence is the first step you take to say, yeah, it's coherent. Let's go and investigate if it's true or not. But if something's not even coherent, you're not even gonna bother to go and find out if it's true. But that's, that's, that's if a person takes their limited perspective and believes if it doesn't make sense to me, it means it's not it's not coherent, it's not real in the real world. No, no, but that's not how you have to show logical incoherence. Logical incoherence, what you have to do is write the statement out and then derive from it a self-contradiction. So I'll give an example. If you say, you write the sentence, there is a squared circle, okay? 
what you then do is define square and define circle and then you realize another sentence that there is a shape that has four sides that does not have four I sides. totally agree with you. And then it, then so look, it's, look, it's, it's, it's free will. Yeah. But you can do that. So someone will argue you can do that with free will. Well, someone will say, yeah, you can do that. free will is the key definition. As a Muslim, yes. here's my stance. Yes. They, and by the way, there's Muslim scholars who discuss this who are far more knowledgeable than me. I, I, I skip that. But in this discussion, even some Muslims come up to me and they try and get answers. I literally go back to the statement of the Prophet, which is, do not reflect about the nature of God, reflect about uh, nature itself, this is about creation. I believe free will to be true, free choice to be true, predestination to be true. Someone may say, how do you reconcile the two? I say, because I believe the Quran to be true, I believe there is a reconciliation, even if my mind can't achieve it. Yeah, but that's such a reason. It's not. It is, because you're basically saying, I believe the Quran to be true. Someone can ask me, why do you believe the Quran to be true? Well, it comes from God. Well, why do you believe in God? Or this no, 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 I wouldn't do that. Because it, I wouldn't the Quran do that. states so, example, that the Quran is true. No, I wouldn't do that. So, that would be certain. Yeah. What I would do is to prove the Quran is true, I would use independent arguments. For example, the, so this is why I want to give you this book as well. So things about the prophecies of the Prophet, peace be upon him, yeah. linguistic miracle, preservation, the sociological impact of the Quran, I would use independent arguments and then I would say, because what it says in the Quran is true, therefore it's true. Right? I'll give you one other analogy from the Quran. I'll give you this as a free gift for you. Um, in the Quran, it mentions yeah. there's a tree that's going to grow in hellfire. Now the people at the time, the pagans, they made fun of Islam because they said, how can a tree grow in hellfire? Because tree, firstly, if you put a tree in a volcano, what happens? It burns. Hellfire is hotter than a volcano. So how can a tree grow in hellfire? And what the Quran says about this is this was a trial for the disbelievers. Because if God has set the laws of motion, uh, so the uniformity of nature, and God has set the parameters which allow the existence of life on earth, then for God to go against the laws of nature is nothing. In the same way, people laugh at, say, the virgin birth, something we both believe in. Fundamentally, why is it that no scientists using methodological naturalism will believe in it? It's because they don't believe in supernatural. We would, as Muslims and Christians, we would say, God set the uniformity of nature and God can operate outside of it. And it's just as easy for God to create a virgin uh, birth as it is for God to create a normal reproductive cycle. Right? Okay, but, but, sorry, uh, did I interrupt you? No, it's fine. Okay. Um, what I'll say though, that there has to be a distinction between what is physically impossible and what's logically impossible. Yes. So We also have that yeah, distinction. So, yeah, so something like a virgin birth, walking on water, all those sort of things that people say, how can this happen? Those are things which are, are our, our understanding of the physical laws that seems to transgress them, so it's physically impossible. But it's not logically impossible in that there is no self-contradiction when you define the term. And so it's logically possible. Om omnipotence is the power or the ability to perform any logically possible action. And so even if something's physically impossible, God can still do it as long as it's not logically impossible. Because something that's logically impossible, anyway, doesn't even make well, sense. It's basically, I, yeah. I would take the, a, um, I would take the sort of, uh, the view that that statement is meaningless. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I wouldn't, because as Muslims, we wouldn't say God can't do this, because it doesn't fit the majesty of God for you to say God can't do this. So what you would say with a uh, with something that's uh, logically impossible, because it's a self-contradiction, we would simply say it's a meaningless statement, which is why, look, as a Muslim, my entire disagreement with Christianity is I have no problem with its ethics or its this or its that. The main issue is I believe theologically the statement of the Trinity and uh, and uh, the sharing of with, with the uh, Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. For me, that's the ultimate blasphemy. Yeah, and this is why in Islam, one of the things that God reminds humanity of is that to say the statement God has a son, it's a very light statement. But God says if the heavens heard the statement, they would rip apart. Meaning it's a very blasphemous. Statement. So this is why I go down the route of um, we had a philosophical discussion, but I also go down the route of historically saying why on earth would God send a message in the uh, with Jesus, which totally contradicts the messages of all the other prophets, and is so difficult to grasp, and it's not. 
not something if you're on a desert island you can come up with. So going back to my original point, that's the foundation of Solomon. What do you mean and what do you understand by the doctrine of the Trinity? Just so I understand what you're saying, sure. I, you might be rejecting something or the understanding of the Trinity that I actually sure. don't hold to. So, so the uh, three persons, right? Co-equal, co-eternal, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Um, what about the oneness of God? What, what does it mean for there to be one God? Because Christians will claim to be one of you. They will say there's one God. What do they mean by that? Yeah. When you understand that. So they would say that God is one, uh, but there's three essences. Okay, but so what they're referring to with that the term one God, they're referring to the nature that they share, the community that they make up, or they, what, what do you mean? Because they would claim monotheism. Okay, so I'm going to go out on a limb here because okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Right? No, it's fine. No. I'm just going to yeah, have, yeah, have yeah. a wild stab at the no, no. I'm assuming the nature. Okay. Um, I would disagree. I would say a lot of Christians or some people will argue in that way but I'll say actually if you do a historical analysis of the Doctrine of Trinity um, the reference one God solely refers to the Father so the Father is the one God scripturally and throughout church history I haven't really heard other Christians yeah, I mean, say that okay, I'll give, I'll give you, so it's called the doctrine of the monarchy of the Father and basically the doctrine of, of the, the monarchy, monarchy of the father, father. i'll the google monarchy. it i've never google, heard it before google, google. um and you'll find like loads of papers that say the neglect of monarchy of the father because a lot of christians don't actually speak about it but if you do a historical analysis specifically or even around nicaea if i read to you the nicene creed what's the first sentence i believe in one god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth it doesn't mention holy ghost then no it doesn't son. then give the term god to the son it calls one lord jesus christ and then it says the holy spirit but god is never used as a referring expression to the son or to the holy spirit but i would say like again i'm going on a limb here but i would say almost all the christians i've ever come across would totally disagree with i know but it's, it's a problem because if i'm on I, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude but a lot of christians don't actually study church history and say what did what was the doctrine of the trinity that the third century actually argued for the fourth century argued for the second century argued for? what was it it was actually surrounded this idea of there is one god the father yet there are three divine persons so the idea here is i'll start from the, the second century there are three divine persons father son and holy spirit right each are omnipotent omniscient perfectly good so they're, they're perfect in their essence yet there is only one who is called god that is the first person the father because god is only a referring expression for the ultimate divine person so the one who everything comes from okay so again i'm gonna go well, i would say even a muslim would agree with that definitely they would say well what does it mean for people no 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 we, we, we would never muslims would never call god the father no no so what i mean by that i mean if, if you spoke to a muslim they'll say what do you mean by god no, he's the ultimate divine being oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. so the ultimate divine being is yeah. the father but what yes. what we need to do is um I, I hate talking about something that i don't really know about yeah. so i'm gonna uh, read up on that and we'll we can discuss it again but i'm saying why i really love it is because it fits also with the scriptural text but wouldn't so, that wouldn't that also mean that the vast majority of christians um they just don't believe in the correct version of the Trinity. I would say to yes, if I'm honest. But the vast majority. No, no, no. That means they're not saved. No, 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 no. You don't need to. You don't need to believe in the. Or you don't. Uh, you don't need to understand the workings of the Trinity to be able to be saved. No, but that's a very Salvation. big theological I would say to you, point. No, my problem is, is that there is a lack of clarity for people in understanding what does the Trinity actually do. And this is a problem I have with other Christians as well. Because if I ask a Christian, well, tell me, tell me who is God, or what does the Trinity mean to you? For me, it'll not be a lot of confused understanding. Yeah, there's yeah. three, but there's this. I, I what would, is this I would say, that? Muslim uh, yeah. Dawa guys probably know more. Yeah, but maybe. <laughs> but I would say, why this view that the one God is the Father, yet there are three co-equal divine persons, it fits with all of the scriptural passages that any Muslim would bring. So yeah, Muslim would say to you, well, maybe you'll say, or someone will say, Father's greater than I. Yeah, Father's greater than I. Or there is one, I'm the one true God. Jesus said, the one true God. Or, I'm going to my Father and your Father. My God, yes, 
You could have you know one. It'd be great if you tried that with Hashim. <laughs> Where is he? I was just going to ask He's over there somewhere. He's lurking around. He's, he's, looking for, he's looking for fresh meat. I haven't had it. Yeah, I was going to do it for a long time. Maybe it'll be good. But if I'm honest, it was more my... Because um, I've never heard that discussion. Yeah, it was more my PhD research. Really, because I had to go into the fourth century and read the text by Gregory of Nis and all these important people. And so a guy I'll point you to is like Gregory of Nazianzus. Very, very, very... Gregory of... Naz Nazianzus. If you do remember it, very, very, very important theologian in the fourth century. He was part of the Council of Constantinople. He was the head of the it. The first council. No, the, so the second one that declared what we would take as a doctrine of the Trinity, because Nicaea was in 325, and in 381 he had Constantinople. So the creed that most Christians um, uh, uh, recite today is the second one. He was the leader of that. And this is what this is his view. And he, um, be, he believed in the uh, monarchy of the, the father. father. Yes. So the father is the one God. Yet there are three divine persons. So you have to qualify. So as a Muslim and a Christian, I would take it. I agree with you. There is one God who is one unipersonal being. Okay. I will term in the Father. Maybe you might term in the Allah or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Where we will differ is saying there are two other divine persons. So. The one but wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. you say you're opening you're opening yourself up more to the criticisms that the Muslims have been making against? Why? Uh, because the, I mean, I don't agree with your view or the other Christian view, but I can see why the other Christian view is it, 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 it's it's, um, it, it's it's more protected than this one. Because this one, what you're doing is you're basically conceding. No, no, I'm not conceding. I'm saying actually, if you study the history, the church never actually held to what. Um, yeah, but the, then, but then a Muslim. What, what contemporary Christians sure. might be telling people. But then a Muslim, yeah. uh, especially people like Hashim yes. Mansur, yeah. they would just go to town with that. They'll say, oh, well, the, 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 theologically, that means the vast majority of Christians don't know what they're talking about. No, I, I would say to you, so it's a, there's a very, very good paper. The main the main person to look at is um, a guy called Boo Branson. They always have weird names. Yeah. Yeah. He's called Boo Branson. Um, he's a good guy, so I've shown him to him a few times. And um, he's the one, he did a PowerPoint presentation, which is very accessible to loads of people, where he basically brought up all the text, and it's called The Neglected Monarchy of the Father. You can find on YouTube. Can you just put his name in there? Yes. Sonic. So, yeah, Boo Branson, Trinity, Monarchy of the Father. Look into you are, you have some yeah. videos on it, yeah? Yeah, it's on YouTube. There's like a, um, if you go on to, um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the one. So there's quite a few, but you can watch like a few of them where he goes into it. I'm going to send this to Hashim. Do send it, because <laughs> for me though, that, this is one of the reasons why I've been to Cabin being in like nearly a year and a half. And I want to come up because I'm, I want to correct this I think you Trinity. and me were here at the time Aaron Yeah, Rock. I was like, <laughs> yeah, it was with them. That Aaron Ross. Yeah, that was the one. That was the last one. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I, for me, I really want to people to start understanding there's an alternative understanding of the Trinity, which actually fits the majority of texts that a lot of people will bring. Because the problem you have is why it's not protected for a normal Christian. Because a Christian would say the one God is a tri-personal being made up of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the problem you have is Scripture never teaches that. Scripture never says God is a tri-person. Well, that's exactly what Hashim. Yes, so I say Scripture says God is one person, one being. He is, and we will tell him the Father. That's what it says in Scripture. Right. And Jesus says it. Paul says Jesus it. Gives it like, yeah. So it goes throughout. So I'll say yeah. it fits with the scriptural text, yeah. and it also fits with the historical narrative. Yeah. But I'll catch I, I, I'd, I'd love to see that yeah, discussion. Yeah, we, we can have a discussion. If he's around, he's here. Yeah. What did, you, what, what did you think of Aaron Ra? Um, I don't know enough about him, if um, I'm honest. So, um, I would say for me though, I do reject scientism.